Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Texas will be providing charter buses to send illegal immigrants to Washington, D.C. This is part of the governor's latest plans to deal with the surge in illegal border crossings. President Biden is extending the pause on student loan repayments. He's hoping to relieve financial constraints for student loan holders, but some experts say somebody else may have to foot the bill. More documents and messages surfacing from Hunter Biden's laptop this week. President Biden denies having any knowledge of his son's overseas business dealings. However, newly released emails seem to tell a different story. The Biden administration announces an additional $100 million worth of military equipment going to Ukrainian forces. But that is just a fraction of the money the European Union pays Russia for energy on a daily basis. Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown-Jackson has spurred a conversation on sentencing guidelines for child pornography. Republican Senator Josh Hawley introduces a bill to mandate harsher sentences for offenders but it's blocked by a top Democrat. Find out why. We start with news at the border. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is announcing new actions his state is taking to combat the border crisis. This includes sending illegal immigrants to Washington, D.C. Texas is providing charter buses to send these illegal immigrants who have been dropped off by the Biden administration to Washington, D.C. We are sending them to the United States Capitol where the Biden administration will be able to more immediately address the needs of the people that they are allowing to come across our border. Other actions Texas is taking include adopting a zero tolerance policy for unsafe vehicles smuggling immigrants across the border. The Texas Department of Public Safety will conduct enhanced safety inspections of vehicles at international ports of entry. Texas authorities will also deploy boat blockades at appropriate regions in the Rio Grande River, deploy razor wire at low water crossings and high traffic areas, and create container blockades to drive people away from low water crossings. Meanwhile, the White House today defended the Department of Homeland Security's decision to provide free cell phones to illegal immigrants. They say the DHS uses the cell phones to monitor immigrants who've been released into the U.S. while waiting for their cases to be heard. The Biden administration is extending the pause on student loan repayments again. If this keeps happening, experts say the money will have to come from somewhere else. The question is where? And TD's Arlene Richards reports. President Joe Biden announced on Wednesday that his administration was extending the pause on student loan repayments through August 31st of this year. The president said America is stronger economically than it was a year ago. He said Americans are still recovering from the pandemic and that recent data from the Federal Reserve suggests that millions of borrowers would have difficulty making payments. He encouraged borrowers to work with the Department of Education to find ways to lower their payments. Jonathan Butcher, who is with the Heritage Foundation, said it is questionable as to whether the loans will be repaid or not, but somebody has to pay them. Are there any consequences to students not repaying their loans? Well, I think come campaign season, what's more likely is that the cost of this, which is substantial, I mean, we're talking $1.7 trillion in outstanding loans right now, would ultimately be worked into the payments that we make on our federal taxes every year. It, it simply won't disappear. He says estimates on how much this is costing are only going to increase as the extensions to the freeze continue. Glenn Ricketts, a public affairs officer at the National Association of Scholars, agrees that somebody has to pay the loans. Uh, the money has to come from someplace, and I guess the question is where? Will the taxpayers foot the, pick up the tab, or will we simply have to cut other uh, federal programs in order to make good on these loan debts? President Biden said that the additional time will help borrowers reach greater financial security and support the Department of Education's efforts to improve student loan programs. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. As more documents and messages surface from Hunter Biden's laptop this week, President Biden has several times denied having any knowledge of his son's overseas business dealings. However, newly released emails seem to say otherwise. NTD's Chenny Wu tells us more. 
according to emails released by Fox News. In 2017, President Biden appeared to have written a college recommendation letter for the son of a Chinese businessman linked to Hunter Biden. At the time that emails were sent, Joe Biden had just stepped down as vice president less than a month ago. The emails reviewed by Fox News Digital were found on a laptop that formerly belonged to Hunter. They're between Hunter and his business associates involved in his firm Rosemont Seneca's joint venture with Chinese investment firms Bohai Capital and BHR. In the email chain, a Chinese businessman by the name of Jonathan Lee asked for advice relating to his son's application to American universities, including Brown, Cornell and New York University. Weeks later, Eric Schwerin, who was then serving as the president of Rosemont Seneca, replied to Lee. He wrote, Hunter asked me to send you a copy of the recommendation letter that he asked his father to write on behalf of Christopher for Brown University. However, President Biden has several times denied knowledge of his son's business activities. On Sunday, Biden's chief of staff, Ron Klain, told ABC News that the president believes that Hunter did not break the law. And on Tuesday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki again reiterated that the president has never spoken with his son about his overseas business dealings. But that raises the question of why Biden would agree to write the recommendation letter for the Chinese executive's son. Reports about the younger Biden's laptop first surfaced in late 2020, with just days to go before the general election. But social media platforms quickly moved to suppress them. But in recent weeks, The Washington Post and other news outlets have now verified the emails and documents on the laptop. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware is investigating Hunter Biden for alleged tax fraud, lobbying crimes and money laundering. NTD is not able to independently verify these claims, and Hunter Biden's attorney did not respond to requests for comment before airtime. Chenny Wu, NTD News. And today, President Biden detailed new measures the U.S. is taking to increase economic pressure on Russia. The actions include sanctioning Russia's largest financial institutions and more of Russia's elite and their families. Biden did not name any of the individuals being sanctioned directly, but the list includes Vladimir Putin's two adult daughters, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's wife and daughter, and members of Russia's Security Council. These oligarchs and their family members are not allowed to hold on to their wealth in Europe and the United States and keep these yachts worth hundreds of millions of dollars, their luxury vacation homes, while children in Ukraine are being killed, displaced from their homes every single day. Biden added that he will be signing an executive order to ban any new U.S. investments in Russia. He also praised the more than 600 companies that have chosen to leave Russia, including McDonald's and Exxon. The Biden administration announced an additional $100 million worth of military equipment will be provided to Ukrainian forces. That brings the total to $1.7 billion in U.S. aid to Ukraine since the Russian invasion. But that doesn't compare to what the European Union pays Russia for energy on a daily basis. And TD's Jason Perry has the story. This $100 million is uh, designed to help us meet an urgent Ukrainian need for additional Javelin anti-armor systems. The Javelin is an American-made portable anti-tank missile system. The warhead locks onto the target before launch and has automated guidance. It's designed to defeat modern tanks by hitting them from above, where their armor is thinnest. Kirby says they have been used very effectively to combat the Russian attack in Ukraine. This will be the sixth drawdown of equipment from uh, DOD inventories for Ukraine since August of 2021 combined with the $300 million in military assistance that we just announced on the 1st of April, uh, this will bring the total U.S. security assistance commitment to Ukraine to more than $1.7 billion since the beginning, just the beginning, of the Russian invasion uh, on the 24th of February. But what does a billion dollars, which is just under a billion euros, represent to Ukrainian forces? The European Union High Representative explains. We have given Ukraine 1 billion euros. It might seem a lot, but 1 billion euros is what we pay Putin every day for the energy he provides us. Since the beginning of the war, we have given him 35 billion euros. Compare that to the 1 billion euros that we have given to Ukraine in arms and weapons. This map shows the gas pipelines from Russia to Europe. The EU has proposed a ban on coal imports from Russia, and that would be the first EU sanction that targets Russia's energy sector. 
European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said the ban on coal imports would be worth $4.4 billion per year. And the EU has started working on additional measures, including sanctions on oil imports. Jason Perry, NTD News. The U.S. Air Force and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, announced Tuesday that they recently completed the country's second successful in-flight test of a hypersonic cruise missile produced by Lockheed Martin. DARPA did not specify when the test was conducted, but the announcement comes two weeks after President Biden confirmed that Russia's military used a hypersonic missile in Ukraine. Also on Tuesday, the U.S., U.K. and Australia announced that the countries will work together to develop hypersonic missiles under the newly created AUKUS partnership. U.S. defense officials say hypersonic missiles fly at five times the speed of sound. And in addition to speed, the missiles are highly maneuverable and fly at low altitudes, making them hard to detect and defend against. On Capitol Hill, the clash continues over who's to blame for the high gas prices. Is it President Putin, President Biden, or Big Oil? NTD's Iris Tao brings us more from a congressional hearing today where it all plays out. We're here to get answers from the big oil companies about why they're ripping off the American people. Blaming oil companies for high fuel prices, House Democrats grilled executives of Exxon, Chevron, and other industry leaders in a Wednesday hearing. These prices are straining our constituents' budgets and their patients. But oil executives denied the charges that they're utilizing energy shortfalls to boost profits. Shell does not set or control the price of crude oil. We do not control the market price of crude oil. No single company sets the price of oil or gasoline. They said the high gas prices stem from shortages driven first by a rebound of demand and later by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And these market dynamics, they said, are not controlled by the companies. And we have no tolerance for price gouging. Meanwhile, today is purely political. The hearing soon turned into a partisan clash, with Republicans saying it's Biden's fault and that the White House is trying to use oil companies as a cover. This is not the Putin price hike or the result of companies suddenly deciding to make money in 2022. This is the Biden price hike. The White House has been criticizing oil companies for not using enough permits to drill. But Republicans say it's Biden's energy policies that have created a hostile environment for them to do so. President Biden and the majority Democrats should accept responsibility. Meanwhile, the oil executives told lawmakers that they're facing a variety of challenges just like other sectors. That includes worker shortages, high prices and supply constraints, all of which they said are hindering their ability to ramp up production. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. President Biden says he's working to apply maximum pressure on Russia, but cutting off Russian oil means there's a void to fill in the global market. The White House has asked Iran to ramp up their oil production to help fill that void. This as the administration inches closer to reviving the Iran nuclear deal. But lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are voicing concern. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the details for us. Basically, this Iran nuclear deal that the White House is working to revive right now is meant to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon, placing restrictions on them, while in exchange it will, uh, the U.S. will lift sanctions on Iran. And we heard from House Republicans and House Democrats today who say they're concerned that by lifting these sanctions, it could enrich the regime, but not only that, it could also embolden terrorists. Here's why. Iran, strengthened with billions of dollars in sanctions relief, would be an enormous danger to Americans at home and abroad and to our allies. It would weaken our fight against terror. When their lips are moving, they're lying. And they have given us nothing to indicate that that has changed. In summary, I think that we, we cannot afford another failed agreement. So that House Democrat we just heard from is on the Armed Services Committee, and she specifically says that she supports former President Trump's maximum pressure approach to this Iran nuclear deal. So one concern that these lawmakers from both parties had is that they're getting very little information about how these negotiation talks are unfolding, which they say is an issue. I don't know exactly what's in this deal. 
I, I can't tell you because they haven't allowed us to look at it. But Republicans really zeroed in and emphasized the fact that Russia is sitting at that negotiation table right now. And these Republicans say they're concerned that if this deal is met, it will allow um, Russia and Iran to tighten their relations. And then Iran could help Russia and get around those sanctions that Western countries and President Biden are imposing on Russia right now. Let's listen. Allowing Russia to build for $10 billion the nuclear power plant in Iran, to get around the very sanctions we're implementing on, on them right now for their actions in Ukraine. Where Iran has the rest of the globe in a situation and the United States, this administration, trying to get their hands on their oil. And I asked Representative Gottheimer how unified Democrats and Republicans are on this topic. He says that while everybody does have their personal concerns, both parties are unified around the fact that they'll do everything they can to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. And then later when we heard from those House Republicans, the top Republican on the Foreign Affairs Committee says he believes they have enough Democrats that will join with them to reverse any Iran nuclear deal that could have severe consequences. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Republican Senator Josh Hawley is seeking tougher punishment for child sex offenders, but his efforts have come to a standstill. Yesterday, a top Democrat blocked Hawley's bill that mandated a five-year minimum sentence for possession of child pornography. NTD's Grace Coulter brings us the details. A bill to enhance the penalties for possessing child pornography and prevent judges from sentencing offenders below the federal guidelines has been stopped in its tracks. The bill, introduced by Republican Senator Josh Hawley, was blocked by Senate Majority Whip Dick Durbin Tuesday. In his objection, Durbin questioned Hawley's timing. I have to ask myself, why now? Why does the junior senator from Missouri bring this bill to the floor of the United States Senate today? Durbin went on to assert that it's solely because of Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson. For weeks, Hawley has grilled Jackson on her history of giving child pornography offenders shorter sentences than what government guidelines recommend. The senator asks why now? Why act now? Because it's a crisis now. Because there are 85 million images of children being exploited on the internet now. Because child exploitation is exploding in this country now. They say, oh, Judge Jackson, it's not her fault. You should act in the law to change the law. But when we come to change the law and to do what this Congress did in 2003, to do it now in 2022, a measure that Senator Durbin supported in 2003, he says, oh, no, no, we don't need to act now. Why do it? It's rushed. Durbin likewise pointed to the law he supported in 2003, but noted that it was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2005. Durbin acknowledged that there are valid questions around sentencing guidelines, but ultimately said that the guidelines in Hawley's bill don't reflect the reality of today. We know as well that uh, the guidelines were written, some were written in an era when the materials we're talking about were physical materials, and we now live in a world of internet and access to not just tens and hundreds, but thousands of images, if that is your decision. Meanwhile, child advocates have argued that exactly because we now live in a world of internet with easy access to thousands of images, the penalties need to be harsher to create a greater deterrent. Grace Coulter, NTD News. And officials in Marion County, Florida, have arrested over two dozen men for seeking sex with kids or sending child pornography. The arrests happened during a six-day undercover sting operation called April Fools. Multiple law enforcement agencies were part of the undercover operation. Nineteen of the men were arrested after undercover officers exchanged messages with them. The men then traveled to various locations in Marion County, Florida, expecting to meet a child between ages 12 and 16 for sexual activity but they met law enforcement instead. Speaking at a news conference, Marion County Sheriff Billy Woods said officials have now arrested 27 individuals as part of the operation. Woods said one of those individuals works as a Florida Department of Corrections officer, another works in the school system, and one is the son of a city council member. The sheriff urged parents to keep tabs on their children and ensure they're using technology safely. 
Special counsel John Durham asked the court on Monday to admit a text message written by former Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman. The text message allegedly confirms that the cybersecurity lawyer lied to the FBI general counsel when he presented information about then-presidential candidate Donald Trump. Sussman allegedly concealed that he was working for the Democratic National Committee, Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, and tech executive Rodney Joffe when he provided the claim that the Trump organization had a secret link with a Russian bank. Sussman's lawyers previously denied that their client made any false statements and argued that such a statement would have been secondary and not significant to the case. However, Duran's latest filing suggests that Sussman may have put the statement in writing. And in lighter news from the nation's capital, a fox found a new home on the Capitol grounds in Washington, D.C. But animal control had to come to the rescue after the fox bit six people. And TD's Jason Perry has the story. This furry little animal bit six people. This frisky fox has been seen roaming around the Capitol grounds for days, and now it's finally been captured. One of the half dozen people the fox bit was a congressman. Someone comes and yells, hey, there's a fox attacking that guy. And this naughty fox was not easily captured. It took animal control hours before they finally caught it on the Capitol grounds. They would later put it down. It felt like a small dog and I jumped really quick and I was holding my umbrella because I thought I'd have to shoot away. And it's like, that's not a dog, that's a fox. The nibbling fox bit California representative Ami Barra on the leg on his way to work. Capitol police say there could be more than one fox den near the hill. Jason Perry, NTD News. Up next, letting babies die after birth is prohibited by federal law. But some Republican lawmakers think that's what might have happened to five aborted fetuses in Washington, D.C. And the greatest golfer of his generation returns from injury. What are his chances at the Masters? And what will be his toughest challenge? More shortly here on NTD News. Five late-term abortions were reportedly performed in a questionable manner in Washington, D.C. and might have been illegal. Now Republican lawmakers want Mayor Mur Muriel Bowser and the Department of Justice to look into these abortions. The Daily Wire reports that a box with dismembered babies was discovered by a group called the Progressive Anti-Abortion Uprising. The box reportedly contains five late-term aborted babies whose bodies had already formed. Some say the babies might actually have been born alive and then died after birth. One of them had her skull crushed and her brain removed in a manner consistent with partial birth abortion or infanticide. Late-term abortions up until the moment of birth are legal in Washington, D.C. But once a baby is born, it has to be taken care of and can't be allowed to die. Washington police say they think the fetuses were aborted legally. What we're seeing now is they, those fetuses were aborted in accordance with D.C. law. So we are not investigating this incident along those lines. But the GOP lawmakers urging investigation say they aren't sure how D.C. police came to this conclusion. 
Their letter to the mayor reads, instead of ensuring that the horrific deaths of these children were properly investigated, Metropolitan Police made the assumption that each child died as the result of illegal abortion. It is our understanding that this assumption was made without conducting any medical evaluations. We also understand from press reports that the D.C. medical examiner does not plan to perform autopsies on the children. This is completely unacceptable. Tiger Woods is back. The golf legend will be making his comeback at the Masters this week after a 17-month layoff following a car accident that nearly cost him his leg. NTD's Dave Martin has more. As of right now, I feel like I am going to play. And with that, the ever-popular Tiger Woods stunned the golf world and made this year's Masters suddenly a must-see event. The 46-year-old hasn't played in 17 months after being seriously injured in a one-car accident back in February of 2021. Woods had to be extricated from the car using an axe and a pry bar. He suffered a compound fracture to his right leg that surgeons managed to save. He hasn't played on the tour since, though he did play in a father-son competition last December. But Woods had to use a golf car to get around the course, something not allowed on the PGA Tour. And though walking is still a challenge, confidence is something he's never seemed to lack. The question is simple. Do you think you can win the Masters this week? I do. And why not? Woods' 15 major titles trail only Jack Nicklaus's 18, and the Masters is one of his favorites, having won it five times. In fact, the course was altered two decades ago, a process many called tiger-proofing after he dominated the field in 1997 and then completed his tiger slam there four years later. But Woods isn't in his 20s anymore. Should he somehow win this week, he'd be three weeks older than Nicholas was when he won his final major back in 1986. He would also break his 82-win tie with Sam Snead for most career tour victories. If not, he seems happy with where things stand. I think 82 is a pretty good number, and 15 is not too bad either. The first round of the Masters starts this Thursday. Dave Martin, NTD News. Coming up, updates on one of the suspects in the Sacramento shooting. Just weeks before the shooting, he was released early from prison. He was sentenced to 10 years in 2018, but only served four years. According to one report, nearly half of the students in one California school district are chronically absent from class. COVID protocols are to blame, among other reasons. That and more on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com.
Authorities are finding out more about the mass shooting in Sacramento, California this past weekend. One of the suspects was released from jail just weeks before the shooting, despite a 10-year sentence. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. 27-year-old Smiley Martin is one of the suspects in the Sacramento shooting that left six people dead on Sunday. Authorities arrested him on Tuesday and charged him with possession of a firearm by a prohibited person. A spokeswoman for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, or CDCR, told the Sacramento Bee that Martin got an early release from prison this February. Martin was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 2018 for domestic violence and assault with great bodily injury. The CDCR says he had already received 508 days of pre-sentencing credits and received a variety of additional post-sentencing credits. The Bee reported that Martin's criminal record dates back to 2013. Last year, the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office pleaded with the parole board not to grant Martin an early release. They wrote in a letter, inmate Martin's criminal conduct is violent and lengthy. He has no respect for others, for law enforcement or for the law. If he is released early, he will continue to break the law. Martin is currently in the hospital due to injuries during the shooting. The Sacramento Police Department will book him when his condition improves. Allison Lee, NTD News. A group in San Francisco is warning people of its drug crisis through a bo- billboard. As fentanyl deaths rise throughout the city, mothers are calling attention to the deadly drug in the most eye-catching way they can find. Here in Union Square, a popular tourist and shopping area in downtown San Francisco, a new billboard has been put on display highlighting the city's drug crisis. The billboard shows the Golden Gate Bridge and says, famous the world over for our brains, beauty, and now dirt cheap fentanyl. A group of mothers called Mothers Against Drug Deaths raised $25,000 in donations to keep the billboard up for one month in the hotspot area that's often filled with visitors to the city. The people that are there that are homeless and addicted are being preyed upon and they are deteriorating slowly. It's a slow death. Jackie Berlin, one of the members of Mothers Against Drug Deaths, told SF List, we just want to discourage tourism until the city is able to get this under control, especially the open-air drug markets. Some tourists to the city were fortunate to not come across any drug use so far on the streets. Well, it's good to raise awareness. But, um, from what I've seen so far, I don't think it's too, too bad from what I've seen. It seems out of the way, really. It's, you can't notice it much. A few visitors did say they were warned by locals on their way here about possible open-air drug use, but most of them were not aware of the issues the city has been having. But we were told this morning that it is relatively safe in San Francisco. The Hotel Council of San Francisco, the Union Square Alliance, and the Golden Gate Restaurant Association issued a joint response to the billboard saying, the passionate campaign being launched today by MADD, although impactful, is not the solution as it will only hurt local small businesses and our hospitality workers who just now are beginning to crawl out of the economic disaster caused by COVID and its continuing fallout. In the last two years, fentanyl overdoses accounted for more deaths in San Francisco than COVID-19. So far this year, at least 98 deaths for drug overdose have been confirmed so far. About 40% of them have been from fentanyl. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. Half of the students in California's largest school district are chronically absent. Reasons include COVID protocols, a lack of transportation, as well as family and health issues. According to the Los Angeles Times, nearly half of Los Angeles Unified School District, or LAUSD students, have been chronically absent since September. That means about 200,000 students have missed almost 10% of school days this year. LAUSD Superintendent Alberto Carvalho expressed concern in a tweet saying, if we do not address this, we will not be successful at anything else. This comes as the district struggles to recover from setbacks brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Even as schools returned to in-person learning this year and mask mandates were lifted last month. Although nearly 90% of students over 12 years old are vaccinated, those that aren't and who are exposed to the virus still need to be quarantined between 5 days and 10 days, depending on whether they want to take a COVID test or not. 
other reasons for the absenteeism cited in the report were lack of transportation, poor physical or mental health, and family issues. By comparison, according to a January 2022 report by the California Department of Education, for the 2020 to 2021 school year, about 14 percent of students statewide were chronically absent. It was one of the most famous and controversial goals ever. And now the jersey he wore doing it is up for sale. Diego Maradona's iconic blue shirt from the 1986 World Cup match, where he scored both the Hand of God goal and the goal of the century, will soon be auctioned off. The auctioneer Sotheby's said Wednesday it's expected to fetch over $5 million. The controversy came when Maradona jumped at his fist, appeared to touch the ball, though from behind it looked like his head touched it and the goal was allowed. Just minutes later, Maradona struck again. This time he picked up the ball at midfield and amazed the crowd by driving it past five players in 11 seconds to score yet again. The goal was eventually voted by fans as the FIFA World Cup goal of the century. Maradona passed away in 2020. Major League Baseball will be using new technology to replace hand signals for the upcoming season. The league informed clubs this week that the use of PitchCom, a wearable device that transmits signals from catcher to pitcher, will be permitted this season. The device had been used in some minor leagues last year and for big leaguers in spring training this season on an experimental basis. Catchers can wear it as a wristband to communicate the type of pitch and location. The pitcher and up to three defensive players can then hear the instructions through receivers in their caps. An encrypted channel can be used in multiple languages, and teams can program in code words to replace common pitch names. The new technology is expected to cut down on sign stealing where, while improving the pace of play. Billionaire Elon Musk is now on the board of Twitter after he became the company's largest shareholder. He's advocated for online free speech before, which had many believe that he could reinstate former President Trump on the platform. But Twitter says that's not how it works. In a statement to the Daily News, Twitter said that their policy decisions are not determined by the board or shareholders, and that they have no plans to reverse any policy decisions. They did say that input from board members is welcome, but business decisions are made by employees. Musk now owns almost 10 percent of Twitter, which is more than any other shareholder. Former President Trump was banned from allegedly inciting violence. After Elon Musk tweeted about having an edit feature in Twitter, you know, a way to edit your tweets after you post them, Twitter says it's already been working on this for the past year. Why it takes so long to add an edit feature, it didn't say. Twitter says it's going to start testing this feature in a few months, but only on its paid subscription service called Twitter Blue. Twitter Blue costs $3 a month, and you get access to things like an undo tweet feature, ad-free articles, and themes. And coming up, energy independence it continues to be a hot topic among world leaders. China is seeking to increase oil production by investing billions of dollars. And as French presidential candidates make their final push, France's place in the EU is hotly debated. Some politicians want a clear separation from Brussels in order to regain sovereignty. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fighted out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week.
in China news. We have an update on the pandemic situation in Shanghai. The citywide lockdown has been extended and some locals have had enough. Video clips circulating online show residents breaking out of their quarantined compound. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has the details. Shanghai is extending its citywide lockdown. The strict measures were originally set to end Tuesday. But just before lifting that lockdown, Shanghai reported 17,000 new cases of COVID-19 Tuesday. Marking the fifth day in a row, the city had a new high. But due to the Chinese regime's tight control over what information is released and its history of under-reporting virus cases, that number may be much higher in reality. On Wednesday, the city launched another round of mass testing for residents. Meanwhile, Shanghai authorities partly walked back a highly controversial policy, the decision to separate COVID-positive children from their parents. On Wednesday, a Shanghai health official said guardians of COVID-positive children with so-called special requirements could apply to escort the sickened kids, but added the parents must sign a letter acknowledging the risks. The official did not give specifics on what special requirements qualify or how parents can apply. Stuck under Shanghai's lockdown, some locals decided enough was enough. A video clip started circulating online last weekend, capturing a crowd of residents breaking out of their quarantine compound. According to the person who shared the video, the residents just wanted to leave the area to buy groceries. 2022年4月4号晚上8点半. Another similar clip was posted on Monday, showing people rushing out of a quarantine site. The man who shot the video gave more details. He explained that the building has been under lockdown for four days, adding, quote, there's absolutely no food. People are starving and cannot bear it anymore. The situation appeared to escalate soon after, involving both a crowd of protesters and local police. In the clip, a man can be heard saying the police want to arrest people, but people won't let the police do it. China is trying to become more energy independent. Big state-owned oil companies are pouring billions into oil exploration. What might be behind it? Here's NTD's Don Ma. Beijing wants to be much more energy independent. China's three major state-owned oil companies are putting billions of dollars into trying to increase oil production. China is currently an importer of oil. About two-thirds of its oil consumption are imports. Brent Bennett, the policy director at Life Power, says China has a long way to go before it can replace imported oil with domestic oil. They would need to triple um, their product their domestic production to reach the state where the U.S. is now, where our net imports in the U.S. are about zero. So they have a long way to go to get to that point. Though China does have the reserves to increase domestic oil output and theoretically replace oil imports. They have you know, 26 billion barrels uh, proven reserves, according to the Energy Information Administration. So that is uh, that's a significant number. The U.S. has about 50 billion barrels. That's several decades worth of consumption at their current rates. They definitely have the oil and gas in the ground to, to consume. State companies PetroChina, Sinopec, and CNOOC are to spend around $84 billion on oil development and exploration. That's an increase of 6% from last year at the highest level since 2014. So then how long does the process take starting from drilling wells in the ground? It takes a lot of infrastructure. To, uh, to boost domestic output, right? So you need not just to be able to go out and drill wells, which takes uh, six to 12 months you have to drill and complete a well, but you need the pipelines, uh, you need the processing and storage infrastructure, and that infrastructure takes several years to build, and two to three years would be very optimistic. Last year, Beijing barely made any mention of energy independence. So why now is China starting to be worried about energy security? Bennett suggests it has to do in part with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The sanctions that the West is imposing on Russia, uh, I think the Chinese are seeing that they want to ensure more of their own geopolitical security. Then they, they need to uh, secure more supplies of, 
of oil and gas in particular. China's National Energy Agency last week told state energy companies to make, quote, safeguarding, secure and stable energy supply as the top mission. Don Ma, NTD News. Over to the UK. The British government is set to announce its delayed energy strategy tomorrow. It comes as households face higher energy bills and the government looks to reduce reliance on Russian oil and gas. It's believed the strategy was delayed because of concerns over costs. Here's NTD's Jane Werrell with details of what we can expect. The government's much-awaited energy strategy is expected to be announced on Thursday. The UK is set to publish a plan that would boost its own energy production, mainly via offshore wind power and nuclear. The business secretary, Kwasi Kwarteng, recently told The Telegraph that seven nuclear power plants could be built in the UK by 2050. Now, the renewables are set to take take up a significant part of this strategy, and there's talk about relaxing planning laws for wind farms. Now, uh, there are concerns with onshore wind farms um, in particular, and the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps recently called them an eyesore. So it's still unclear how much of the UK's wind power will be generated by offshore or onshore wind farms. And there's, of course, the issue of what to do when the wind doesn't blow. Solar energy is also likely to be part of the plan, with the Chancellor Rishi Sunak recently saying in his spring statement that VAT on solar panels will be cut to zero. And also the plan is likely to include more details on how the UK will wean itself off Russian oil and gas. Ministers have also recently commissioned a new study into fracking, and fracking was, of course, banned in the UK in 2019, and that this indicates that it may be back on the cards. Jane Werrell, NTD News, London. And in France, as presidential candidates make their final push, the country's place in the EU is hotly debated. Some politicians advocate for a clear separation from Brussels in order to regain sovereignty and cite Brexit as a reference. NTD's France correspondent Dave de Vives meets with one of them. The Arc de Triomphe was at the centre of a scandal at the start of this year, when the European flag replaced the French tricolour under the iconic Paris monument. This was to celebrate France taking up the EU Council presidency. But the move sparked public criticism from people who felt it was denying France's sovereignty at the benefit of the EU. As presidential candidates make a final push for the start of the elections this weekend, this topic has polarised the debate. President Emmanuel Macron advocates for a more Europe-centered France. Our role, our defense, our protection. It's a European system that we are building. Having a European ambition in the way we are currently living will allow us to take our policies even further and make them even stronger. But other party leaders from both ends of the political spectrum are criticizing the EU. One of their major concerns is the contradictions between French law and European law. Some politicians want France to quit Europe and take back national sovereignty. They say Brexit showed this was possible. Henri de Lescan is the president of political think tank Carrefour de l'Horloge. Emmanuel Macron clearly stated that he wants to establish Europe's sovereignty. This is treason. If Europe is sovereign, France no longer exists. So we have a president of the French Republic who has sworn to defend its constitution, but decides to abolish it by transferring sovereignty to Europe. This is outrageous. This is high treason. There are several examples of EU laws overriding those of the host nation. One is the control of immigration. European decrees set the rule for the welcoming of migrants in Europe. Any migrant can appeal to the EU Court of Human Rights if the country decides to expel him. Lescoin is calling for the reaffirming of French rule of law. While an actual Brexit referendum is nowhere near a reality in France, criticism of EU institutions has increased among political figures and the public. The first thing to do would be a legal Frexit. To have a serious immigration policy, you would have to get rid of the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. French law would need to prevail over all previous treaties. A poll by Elabe in January showed almost 40% of French people think EU membership brings as many disadvantages as it does advantages. Mainstream French media said Brexit would be a catastrophe for the British economy. It wasn't though, and this has become a case in point for Frexit supporters, 
who say it's possible for France to exist outside of the EU. Though Brexit supporters are less than 30% of the French population, their numbers are growing. And as Brexit showed, anything could happen. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. And in the meantime, the French are adding a bit of fun to the presidential election. They're predicting the outcome in a curious way, through sock sales. Are the forecasts reliable? Let's take a look. Aside from polls, the French are using an unexpected way to predict how the first round of the presidential election will turn out. A French sock retailer put the faces of the eight leading candidates on its products. The owner says percentage of sales hint at the possible winner. Some people answer the telephone for polls, and some buy socks, and the people who buy socks really pay money for them. And so we have a view that's not contradictory to the polls, but that's complementary and should not be dismissed. The top three in most polls are incumbent Emmanuel Macron, Marine Le Pen, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon. But this sock store predicts a different outcome. We conducted the first tally of sales 10 days before the first round of votes a couple of days ago. And for the moment, Eric Zemmour is in first place with around 29 percent of sales. President Emmanuel Macron is at 24 percent, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon is at around 22 percent. These special socks are produced in Portugal, but the store has sold thousands of pairs worldwide since the launch of the initiative. In Germany, the highest selling candidate is Emmanuel Macron, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon is the highest selling candidate in Greece. Eric Zemmour sells as top of the list in Canada. Their predictions add a bit of spice to the ongoing election. We very much need, in a period as complicated as this, to be able to have fun with daily life products like this and have a more fun and unique end to the campaign. The first round of the election will be held on Sunday. If no candidate is declared a winner, a runoff will follow in two weeks between the top two finishers. Coming up, after the fire that swept through the Notre Dame Cathedral, an exhibition using new technology will allow visitors to see not only how restoration work is going, but also travel back in time to explore the cathedral's 850-year history. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Retailers, shopping channels, and now even banks have tried to cancel myself and my pillow. During these times, your support has meant everything to us. So my employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you by passing the savings directly on to you. We're selling the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have my towels with proprietary technology, which makes them soft and absorbent. Towels that work, what a concept. They're made with USA cotton and come in a variety of awesome colors. My six-piece towel set is regularly $109.99, now just $39.99 with your promo code. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive this exclusive offer. If you do it right now, I'm going to include a free gift with your purchase. Thank you and God bless. The restoration of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is projected to finish by April 2024. That's after a devastating fire in 2019 ravaged the historic church. So does that mean the tourist attraction isn't available in the meantime? Not necessarily, thanks to augmented reality. And TD's Chenny Wu tells us more. Three years after the fire that swept through Notre Dame, an exhibition using augmented reality, or AR, will allow people to see not only how restoration work is going, but also travel back in time to explore the cathedral's 850-year history. They will travel back in time in an immersive manner so that they can be in the middle of historical moments that we recreate thanks to 3D and uh, digital technologies. Each visitor is given a histopad, a tablet with which the AR images and videos can be viewed. As you know, the cathedral is now cl closed to visitors, and, uh, 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 but here in the augmented ex exhibition with the histopad, you are able to visit 
the whole place today. According to National Building Museum, large photo panels and 3D models of the cathedral and its decorative details, including a full-size chimera and statue, serve as visual cues for the histopad's explorations. The exhibition's North America debut in Washington, D.C., will take place on the third anniversary of the 2019 fire, April 23, 2022. The exhibition will then travel to 12 other capital cities by 2024. Chenny Wu, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.